All right. Good to see you all. Um, you want to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10 or turn on your electronic device and go to Romans 10. Today I'm going to be starting a 12-part series entitled 12 Scriptures that will set on fire the course of your life. 12 Scriptures that will set on fire the course of your life. I'm told by the media people that's the longest title of any series or sermon that has ever been preached. Um, decided to do this when Wes Fulkerson, well, I've, I've had this information on my desk for about two and a half years. Really feel like the Lord wanted me to put this into a book that people could use for mentoring and um, discipling. But writing a book is, it's not in my, it's very difficult for me. Every word is like, okay, so it's just, just hard. So Wes has uh, said that he's going to help me. So when he said that, Wes Wilkerson said he'd help me. So we're going to do this thing. So today, we're going to do the first one. It'll be the first ch uh, chapter eventually. But 12 scriptures, we'll probably change the title, but right now I like 12 scriptures that will set on fire the course of your life. I did not, dra I did not grab these scriptures willy-nilly. They are scriptures that I have based my life on. In, in, in counseling situations, I use them quite often. If you adopt these scriptures, if you embrace these scriptures into your life, you will experience life differently. You will experience life differently. The first scripture we're going to look at is Romans 10, 11. I've quoted it often. The scripture, here it is, whoever believes in him, Jesus, will not be disappointed. Paul, this scripture comes from Isaiah 28, 16. Isaiah 28, 16. Paul uh, quotes it again in Romans 9, 33. And the apostle Peter quotes it in 1 Peter 2, 6. But before going there, I want to just kind of touch on something important from the book Amos. Amos chapter 7. Verse 7 says this. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. Now, first of all, what's a plumb line? I decided to show you because a lot of you, I don't think, knows what it is. It's one of these doohickeys. I asked them to get me one, and they got me this thing that I could knock you out with. Trust me, this is heavy. But a plumb line is something they use in construction, which helps them build something that's 90 degrees. For, for example, if, you are, if you're building a brick wall. Now, I don't know if construction workers still use this, but um, every guy that I, every, um, when, they, when we did a wall, this big retaining wall in my house, they had one of these so that they could make sure the wall was, was straight. If you don't have some kind of plumb line, you're going to build a wall that goes you know, one way or the other. It's not going to be straight, and it's not going to have structural integrity. You know, um, my assistant, Sylvia, said, yeah, um, I found one of those things, and now I can put wallpaper up straight. She uses this to put up wallpaper. I looked at her, and I said, why would you want to put up wallpaper? <laughs> First of all, it's a lot of work putting it up. Paint goes up easier. Secondly, the female side of the relationship usually gets tired of the wallpaper at some point, and the male side of the family has to scrape the thing off. <laughs> uh-huh. So a plumb line is it's a standard. The standard is 90 percent. You want to build it. So in, in this chapter, chapter seven, the plumb line that the Lord has in his hand is a standard, and the standard is God's word, okay? Verse 8. The Lord said to me, what do you see? And he said, I, a plumb line. The Lord said, behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. And we can't go to the, go look at the rest of this chapter. But God uses the plumb line of his word to, to evaluate Israel how they were building their lives and society, by what standard. And if you read on, 
If you read this um, prophetic word from Amos, you'll see that the Israelites were building their lives upon values and standards other than the word of God, paganism and unrighteousness. And I, now, now, hear me here. I hope you can understand that a Christian, a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, can build his or her life on standards other than God's word. They can build their life upon standards that are not in God's word. As Jesus said, they can build their house upon a sand and not a rock. The tragedy, of course, is that that Christian who builds their house on the sand, Matthew 7, Jesus told a, um, a story about a man who, one man who built his house on a rock, another man who built his house on the sand, the winds and the rain came, and every time I say that, I think of a song we sang. Wise man built his house upon the rock. You guys know that one? See? You guys are old. That, okay. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. And of course, the other one, the rock and the, you know, the, 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 the foolish man builds his house in the sand. The rains and come and everything and at the end you go and, the, and his house went smash. And when I was a kid, we all liked that. Make noise. The tragedy is the Christian who builds his or her house on standards and principles other than God's word, they're going to miss out a lot of what God has for them. So now back to Romans. Verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. That's the gospel. Just a few words, that's the gospel. When someone asks you, how, to be, how do I become a Christian? You only can take them to one scripture, there it is. It really isn't that complicated. We simply confess that we're sinners. We have sinned against, we have transgressed God's standard, his plumb line. And we ask the Lord to forgive us. And in that forgiveness, we're now able to have a relationship with God. And that forgiveness happens because Jesus took our sin, those things that we have done or are going to do in our life that are outside of God's standard, and God is holy, so there, God's a holy, just God. There's consequences for when we sin. And Jesus took the, that judgment upon himself and died for each and every one of us on the cross. So that you and I could know God, have the forgiveness of sins, live with the Holy Spirit inside of us, and have eternal life. What a wonderful gift. Simple truth. How to become a Christian. We all know it. Right? You've probably heard the four spiritual laws. But most people stop right there. They don't go to verse 11. You see, Paul says, you can become a Christian, but there's one other thing. When you become a Christian, there's one thing you have to remember. One important thing that I want you to live your life. How I want you to live your life. Verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. This is my, I guess, my favorite scripture in the Bible. I quote it more often than anything else. I've told my wife I want it on my tombstone. I know no one will go look at it, but I want it there anyway. She goes, Dave, you're going to have to, I'm not, you're going to, I'm going to die first. She always says that. She's 12 and a half years younger than She's 12 and a half years younger than I. I bring her to the mirror and go, look. <laughs> what do you think? She had, she's, she's convinced. Whatever. Paul wants to make sure that these Roman Christians and us remember that God is 100% reliable 100% of the time. God keeps his promises always, always, always. He can do no other. He's holy. 
I like that, that song that uh, Shane wrote. Because we're singing it to God. You are holy. And when you sing that, I hope you recognize that what you're saying is, in your holiness, you do what you say. You don't lie. I can trust. You are 100% faithful. Paul reminds us that we trust God and make decisions in our life based on his word and his principles, his commands, we will not regret it. As the years go by, we can then look back on our life and rejoice in God's faithfulness. His vision, his direction, his provision. And this is what Joshua did in his old age. Joshua 23, 14. This is what it says. Behold, today I'm going the way of all the earth. In other words, I don't have much longer to live. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of the, all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. Isn't Joshua saying, we put our trust in God, we did it his way, and God came through. Romans 10, 11 reminds us that if I do it God's way, even if it goes against society's values, even if it goes against what my heart is screaming for me to do, even if it goes against what my friends are telling me to do, even if it goes against what the government is trying to tell me to do, you do it God's way. If you do it God's way, ultimately, you won't be sorry. You know, the only time I've been sorry in my life is when I haven't done it God's way. I look back at my life and I can see things. We all can. And I always wonder what happened, you know, I wonder what would happen in that situation if I would have done what God wanted me to do. I just know that we have to trust God. And in the trust, you just keep moving forward. Because so often, friends, you make a decision to trust God, a circumstance or decision, and you make the decision and then you start going the way God wants you to go, and it doesn't look very good. It almost looks like God hasn't heard you. It almost looks like God's doing just the opposite of what you're trusting him for. But I'm here to tell you, after being a Christian for 40 years, God always comes through. But you see, we have to endure. We have to wait on God. It's a whole other message, but Psalms 23, 5 says, They that wait in the Lord will not be ashamed. They that wait in the Lord will not be disappointed. They who wait in the Lord will not be disturbed, depending on your translation. In other words, if you wait on God in the midst of making a decision, He's going to come through on you. You're not going to be disappointed in God. Hebrews 10, 36 says this. Who knows where it is? Okay. For you have need of endurance, <laughs> so that when you have done the will of God, you can receive what is promised. Notice, sometimes we have to endure. Sometimes we have to just, just keep walking. Jesus said, take one day at a time. And if you keep doing that, you receive what is promised. Galatians 6. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So many times, I think, I think I know this, Christians miss out on the miracle that God has for them because they give up. It really comes down, I've had so many decisions and, and um, circumstances in my life where I could go one way or the other, and it really boiled down to, am I going to do it God's way or not? And then waiting on God. And I, and I don't want you to think that when you make that decision to trust God in whatever uh, circumstance or situation you want in, everything is rosy. Sometimes it gets worse. You make a decision to follow God and all of a sudden it gets worse. It may cost you. There may be ramifications. <clears throat> you may be persecuted. You may lose a job. You may lose a relationship, lose finances. You may lose friends. But ultimately, when you follow Jesus, you're never sorry. When you follow Jesus, years later, you'll look back and say, whatever I had to give up, glory to God, because where I am now. That's why Paul said, I look on everything that I've lost in my life 
to live for Jesus, and it's like garbage compared to knowing Jesus and being in his will. I was 24 years old. One month earlier, I was in a service like this, and I was challenged. To, I was already a Christian, but I, I had been challenged to really trust God with my life. Do it his way. And I went forward. I said, okay, I'm going to do it. One month later, God put me to the test. One month later. I had to make a choice between the girl, the woman, the young woman that I loved and had been going with for two and a half years. I wanted to marry her. And I don't want to go into the details a long time ago, except that I had a choice to make. It was very simple. Follow God or get married to this girl. Well, I chose God, obviously. That's why I'm telling you the story. I still remember her driving away in her Datsun station wagon. And if you know what a Datsun is, that simply means you're old. <laughs> Datsun is Nissan. Nissan changed their name. To, it's a long story. But anyway, I don't even know the whole story. But I just know that Datsun and Nissan are the same thing. But anyway, she had a white Datsun station wagon. I saw her drive away and my heart broke because I knew I was never going to see her again. Because what the Lord had me tell her was pretty... <laughs> pretty, uh, this is the way it's going to be, kind of thing. And being 24, I don't think I said it very, uh, well, this is the way it is, you know. So anyway. But, you know, I look back on that decision, and I glorify God. I'm married to an awesome woman today. I got three great, you know, all that would have been different. God had something else planned for me. I just had to be obedient. A couple years later, I'm 28 years old. My brother Mark and I are attending seminary in Dubuque, Iowa. It's a denominational seminary. It's very liberal. It seemed like every day Mark and I were defending God's word. We were defending the, the inerrancy and the infallibility of God, God's word on every issue you can imagine. They were trying to tell us that whole sections of God's word you didn't have to you know, really believe. Then it came time to go on our internship. You go for two years, you go on an internship for a year, and then you come back for your final fourth year. I, I knew in my heart of hearts, I can't do this. I can't be part of this. I can't be part of this denomination. It was, a t I think, one of the hardest decisions I ever made in my life. Because I knew I was going to disappoint my family. I was going to disappoint numerous people who had been giving to Mark and I monthly so that we could go to school. My father said, we Hoffmans have been blank, this particular denomination, for 400 years. <laughs> he said it to me. I don't know how he knew that, but he was pretty positive. <laughs> Good German stock, 400 years. We've always been this particular. What are you doing? My mother called us and asked us not to move home, not move back to San Diego, go somewhere else. <laughs> and she said that because she was worried about my father's health. Then I had, Mark had lots of people telling me that stay in this denomination. If you leave, who's going to help reform it? Stay in so that you can help change it. Well, Mark and I knew that wasn't going to happen. It had already gone too far. And on top of all that, I knew that I would be leaving security. They had already told me, and I'm sure they told Mark too, that because you're one of the few conservatives here, there's churches out there that want you. You don't have to even, as soon as you graduate, you'll have four or five churches that will be vying for you. You're going to have a great salary. I mean, I could have, a, I could have started out with a great salary that took me probably 20 years to finally get. Anyway, I'm not bitter, God. I'm not at all. And I had this, and of course, to leave all that for nothing. 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 Blackness. I don't know. 
I remember Mark and I driving out of Dubuque, Iowa, and that's always a good thing, trust me. <laughs> driving out of Dubuque, Iowa, and Mark and I were looking at one another going, oh my goodness, what are we doing? Where are we going? But I want you to know that that decision, and I know Mark would say something along these same lines, that decision to do what God wanted us to do and walk into an unknown future set on fire the course of my life. <laughs> Trusting God. There have been so many decisions, temptations, compromises that I've been tempted with throughout my life. And I told you whenever I've compromised or rationalized, I've always regretted it. Mark and I, um, it was hard starting this church. And I, I don't want to make it out like it was, you know, that uh, somehow we should be pitied or something. We take an offering for us. But um, <laughs> it was tough. It really was. I remember going over to my brother's house, he and, he and Linda, and uh, Neil was a little baby, and Neil's bedroom was a closet. It was tough. But even then, we didn't regret doing things God's way. There was a peace and a, and a, and a, a joy of knowing that we're, we're in the river of God. We don't know where we're going. We had, we had people tell us, how can you tell us you're in God's will? Look, the way you're living. How can this be God? And then when they were gone, you would say, yeah, how can this be you? Just being honest with you. Mark and I have had staff pastors here at this church try to really hurt this place. We've had people that have caused, tried to cause dissension and hindrances to what God has been trying to do here. And, you know, inside you want to defend, you want to do things, but God has told us to do certain things. You know, the board was with us. One guy in particular, a staff pastor that we had let go, he was, he was teaching our young people that there was whole portions of Scripture that were, for, that were not for today. Mike, you were on the board, you remember that. Well, what do you think Mark and I did? Oh, good job, dude. No! I'm sorry, you can't, you can't be here anymore. Well, this young man, you remember Mike, he got a hold of the the mailing list of everybody in the church and wrote them all a letter about how wonderful Mark and Dave were. <laughs> if you believe that, I've got some land. And that's not what he said. <laughs> What's, what surprised me is almost overnight, we lost a lot of people in the church. There's no way to really know, but it's about 150, uh, somewhere maybe a little less. I don't know. But it amazed me how quick people believe the worst of other people. That was really a lesson for me. It really is shocking. And this is kind of a side note. When you hear something about someone else, don't just believe it right off the bat. Especially someone who's in the ministry in, in some way. Look, it's not, I'm not naive. It's not easy to trust God when you can't see around the corner. But I'll tell you this, the decisions you make to trust God when you cannot see around the corner are the decisions that will set, the, the, the set on fire the course of your life that Jesus has for you. The truth is you and I cannot have a significant relationship with anybody, let alone God, if we don't trust them. How can you have a relationship with anybody of any significance if you don't trust them? If you don't trust them, you're suspicious. You're going to live in suspicion of them. And the suspicion is that they might not always think of your best. They might even say or do something to harm you. They, at some point, they may do something or they may think something. They just may not have your best interest at heart. And so how can you ever have a meaningful relationship with them? You may say, that person is a nice, if someone asks you, you may say, 
he or she's a nice person. You may speak well of them, but you'll never be close to that person because you don't trust them. You have suspicions in your heart against them. Now, please don't miss this. That's the way many Christians live their life with Jesus. They profess him. They say they love him. They pray to him. They speak well of him. But in the core of their being, they don't trust him. They're suspicious of Jesus. That somehow God doesn't have the best for them. Somehow things aren't going to work the best for them if they do it God's way. They are, susp- they are suspicious that the way of the Bible, how Jesus is calling them to respond, is inferior. Somehow God won't deliver. But our God is a holy God. He's always faithful, 100% of the time. He's always reliable. He doesn't always do things like we want, but if you trust him in it, you do your best. I'm not standing up here saying that my whole life I've... I'm 100% faithful to God. I, how, I, can't tell, I can't tell you that. I just know the times I haven't been are the times I regret. He is faithful to all his promises. 2 Corinthians 1.20 tells us this. For as many as are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. God will show himself faithful to the Christian who puts his trust in him. Let's just read a couple of scriptures about God's faithfulness. These are just a few of the myriads. Just kind of my favorites, I guess. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God. The the faithful God who keeps his covenants and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians 1.9. God is faithful. Through him you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Hebrews 10.23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Again, these are only a few scriptures of myriads of them. Now, make no mistake, I I, I want to pound this in. Trust in God, doing it His way, going down, start walking the way of holiness, the highway of holiness, may be tough at first. Initially, things may not go very well. You may be ridiculed. You may lose. You may even be persecuted. But ultimately, you will reap the promise of God. Forty years ago, a month before I was faced with, that, faced with that decision with my girlfriend, um, I was sitting in a service like this, and uh, it was an evening service. It's at Faith Chapel, if you guys remember that years ago. And I don't remember who the guy speaking was. I didn't hear a word he was saying anyway. Because Soon, I mean, he just started almost right away. God was talking to me. And I know it was God because he was telling me things I didn't want to hear. I didn't want to hear it. He said to me, this man, in just a few minutes, are going to ask people to come forward to dedicate their lives to Jesus, to go anywhere, do anything for Jesus, say yes to Jesus, yes to Jesus. And I want, and you're going to get up and you're going to go forward. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I had never got in front of, I don't. I hated to be in front of people, which is kind of ironic. I hated to be in front of people. When I had to get a, um, a speech in, at school, it was just like, I couldn't sleep all night. It was horrible. I did not want to go forward. And so, you know, we got, so this guy's waxing eloquently. And I'm having this argument, Jesus, I can, I can do that right here. I don't have to go forward. Sure, I'll go anywhere you want, do anything you want me to do. I'll make that commitment right now. No problem. He would not leave me alone. Then I hear him yell. I mean, I I can't just very firm voice. Get up right now and go. I jump up and I run forward. I'm standing there. Now, the guy hadn't asked for an altar call. (laughs) Nothing. I'm standing there. He stops and looks at me. 
And I'll never forget, he said, well, I guess it's time for an altar call. That's what he said. <laughs> but I want you to know, that decision that night, to obey, to obey God, let his truths guide my steps, as, you know, generally as, as well I could. Set on fire the course of my life. One month later, it was put to the test, wasn't it? I will admit to you, it's easy at 65, been a Christian for 43 years, it's easy to do it God's way. A lot, so much easier now to trust God than it was 43 years ago. I got a whole lifetime of examples of God being faithful. That's why young, young person, when you make this decision to follow Jesus no matter what, it's good to have an older guy or an older woman in your life. They can help you when you start having some doubts. If you're a young person, and I consider you young if you're under 30. If you're 30 years old, you might not think you're young, but you're young. Trust me, you're chill, my goodness. If you put your trust in Jesus, there's no better way to live. There just is no better way. I was watching the television last night, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a person, there's a newscaster that Mary and I like to watch. It's the only one, and we shut it off. But um, we usually tape it. And it's interesting to me how so many people in our culture view truth now. Truth is how you feel. Truth is your opinion. Facts don't matter. Facts do not matter. It's delusional. I listen to this and I think, this has got to be demonic. If whatever facts you want to give me don't agree with my opinion, you're wrong. It doesn't matter. You know, a man running around, I, no, no, I better not say that. It's an amazing phenomenon. I think it is. We used to have something called apologetics in the church. You know why you don't hear much about it anymore? Because telling people about the resurrection of Jesus and that it's a historical fact and all that, they just, it just goes... Pfft. Proverbs 28, 26. I'm not saying that uh, is always true, but... He who trusts in his own heart is a, say it with me, fool. I didn't say that. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seems right unto men, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. I obviously memorized it in a different translation, but anyway. I have a simple question for all of you this morning to close off this message. By what plumb line, by what standard are you living your life? To say it another way, starting right now, today, 1151, how are you going to live the rest of your life? Because I don't think it's, any, it's ever too late to begin. And young person, if you're under 30, you've got your whole life ahead of you, for heaven's sake. You, God is giving you an opportunity. You're young. God is giving you an Youth is a blessing. There's a, a lot of reasons why being young is a blessing. You've got your whole life ahead of you. God can do great things in your life. He wants, to, he wants you to experience great and mighty things in your life. He'll help you marry the right person. He'll help you have a good marriage. My father was a marriage counselor. That was what he was, he was best at. And he said, not one, time in 40, not one time in 40 years did two Christians come t- into his office. He said, even if they told me, I can't stand her. I can't stand him. He said, if they came in the office saying, we know divorce is not right. We know we have to work this out. Help us. Did they not work it out, fall in love again, and have more love than they had before? Not one time, 40 years. Think about that for a minute.
if, you, if, you're, if you're married or about to get married and you've and, uh, only been married a short time and everything's, you know, everything's good, everything's great at first. <laughs> Being married's good. <laughs> I was talking to a brother the other day. He goes, we're fighting now. I said, oh, welcome. Welcome to this. Uh, that's good. Uh. I said, okay. I said, all right. God is giving you an opportunity to grow. God gives you an opportunity to grow. You can grow bitter and angry at your wife, or you can, or, or you can get with her and grow. Get some counseling. And I said, you don't have to go to church. Just get some older couple. Sit down with them. They go, oh, yeah, yeah. We went through that. We're all the same, basically. But you, you'll have a good marriage if you're committed to Jesus. If divorce isn't an option, both of you, you're going to work it out. And then you're going to have a love that you never would have ever had without going through the stuff. I hope each of you in here listening to me hopes and hopes that when you're 65 like me, you can look back at your life and glorify God. God has worked all things together for good in my life. I can just go on and on about how he has blessed me. And if you made a decision to trust God, you're going to become 65 and you're going to say the same thing. Unless you're living in suspicion. If there is suspicion in your relationship with God. So then how do you get over this suspicion? Now, this, is, this, may, this may be where I lose some of you. I don't, like vic- I don't like to talk about victims. Don't tell me you've had a hard life. Listen, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus can change anything. Anything. He can come in the most broken life and he can make something wonderful out of it. So how do you get rid of this suspicion? How do you trust? It's very difficult. You just do it. What do you mean you just do it? You just, you say, I'm going to trust Jesus. And when the doubts come, you go and pray with somebody. You do whatever you have to do to get yourself back on the road again. And pretty soon it won't be so hard. <coughs> See, the devil wants you to make all kinds of excuses. I've been hurt so much in my life, I can't possibly trust God. Don't you think God um, knows about that? And I'm not standing up here and saying, it was, it was pretty easy for me to trust God. I, I, I'm just being honest. Because I had, I, Mark and I grew up in a family, I could trust my parents. I could trust my father. I know he had my best interest at heart, absolutely, possibly, 100%. So it was easy for me to transfer that to God. But I, I understand that some of you didn't. But I can't find anywhere in here where it says that's an excuse not to trust God. It may be harder. And and, and I have compassion. I do. I have compassion for someone who's trying. I really do. The church staff, all of us here, we'll do whatever we can to help you get over that suspicion. But you just do it. You just start on the road. You go one day at a time. Jesus said, live one day at a time. Each day has trouble of its own. Trust God and not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Let me have the worship team back up here. So if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, some of you have a decision to make today. This is what we're going to do. I want you to keep the lights on. Because I don't want to make it easy for you. (laughs) And we're going to remain seated. So when you stand up, everybody will see you're, you're standing up. You know that uh, usually we turn off the lights for a reason. It's easier for people to come forward. This, what I'm going to ask you to do right now is an important decision. Some of you know what's coming. <laughs> God has been asking you, poking you to trust him. In just a second, don't come now. I'm going to ask you to come forward, kneel down. If you know God is calling you to trust him. Some of you have been living in suspicion. You're Christians. You love Jesus. You're going to heaven. You love to worship God, but when it really comes to big decisions, it is hard to trust him. God is calling you right now to trust me. He's saying, trust me. God is calling many of you to say, yes, Lord, I'll go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. 
because you are the way, the truth, and the life. So what, what we're going <clears> to, <throat> you know who you are. What we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to come forward. Everybody's going to see you. The reason why I, I'm doing it this way, I wasn't going to, but I was in my office praying this morning, and this, this is what can I be? Okay, God. Because usually if you do something like this, less people come forward. But sometimes less is more. Jesus is looking for that person who will say, I'm going to trust God with my life. The first group I want, if you're in your 20s and you know God is calling you to trust him, come forward right now. Come on. You, you know who you are. Just stand right I, I, and kneel. Kneel down. Kneel down. 